G'day everyone, and welcome to week 9 of Laws 3006, Administrative Law. Now, right the way through this course, you've all gotten completely sick and tired of me reminding you over and over again that the judicial review process conducts legal review, not merits review. That it reviews whether a decision was made lawfully, not whether the decision was any good. And I'm willing to bet that some of you have thought, well, that actually kind of sucks, because if a public servant follows all the rules, but still makes an awful decision, why shouldn't people affected by that awful decision be able to do something about it? I mean, as a community, we don't just expect public servants to make lawful decisions, we expect them to make good decisions. So what's the use of administrative law if it only knocks out unlawful decisions and not awful decisions? Well, the Kerr Committee back in the 1970s agreed. They said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the courts really can't make executive decisions. So the courts really can't undertake merits review. But there's nothing to stop the government establishing a new executive body whose job is to review the decisions made by other executive bodies. I mean, this is really just like a senior public servant reviewing the decisions made by a more junior public servant, except that it would be a specialist body. Now, a specialist body that lives within the executive would not be offending the separation of powers if it undertook merits review. It was a very clever solution, and the government took it up passing the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act 1975. This week, we're looking at merits review within the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. There are three videos to tackle this week. The first one, this one, looks at the establishment and jurisdiction of the AAT. The second video looks at some of the challenges of merits review, even by a tribunal and it looks at the remedies the AAT can provide. The third video looks at the process of seeking review through the AAT, and then the process of appealing, if necessary, from the AAT to the courts. So the Administrative Appeals Tribunal was established by a piece of legislation as an executive body. The tribunal is not a court, and the members of the tribunal are not judges. They are public servants whose special role is to review the decisions of other public servants. There are equivalents of the AAT in every state and territory. Many of you will be familiar with the QCAT here in Queensland. As a tribunal, the AAT has a limited jurisdiction. Essentially, the Parliament established the AAT, and so the Parliament established those decisions that the AAT is allowed to review. We find that set out in Section 25 of the AAT Act, which says that an enactment may provide that applications may be made to the tribunal for the review of decisions. What this means in a practical sense is that there isn't a single instrument where we can identify all of the decisions that the AAT is allowed to review. As a convenience, the AAT itself does maintain a list, but that's just an informal summary. The list itself doesn't have any legal effect. Jurisdiction is granted by 400 pieces of legislation. So the jurisdiction of the AAT comes from 400 places. And to work out if a decision can be taken to the AAT, well, we really need to go to whatever enactment provides the power for the decision and check to see whether that enactment provides review for the AAT. We've actually already come across one of those provisions way back in week one of the course. Remember I used the example of a young person who wanted to head off backpacking, and so they were applying for a passport? Well, Section 50 of the Australian Passports Act says that if a reviewable decision is made, and reviewable decisions are set in another section, section 48, if a reviewable decision is made, then an application may be made to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for review of that decision. It's that simple. Well, it's simple for us anyway, but even as a law student, your knowledge of the law is towering 
compared to the knowledge that most people have. And so there's a code of practice that requires decision makers to actually advise people of the fact that a decision is reviewable by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. So when a decision is made, the decision notification will actually include a paragraph to tell the person that if they're unhappy with the decision, they have the opportunity to take the decision to the AAT. Now, there are a couple of things to be careful about when it comes to the AAT and jurisdictional issues. First up, it is often the case that a statute will do exactly what we just saw in the Australian Passports Act. The statute will pull out decisions made under a specific section of the Act, and they're the ones, they're the only ones, that you can ask the AAT to review. So it may well be that some decisions under a piece of legislation are reviewable, but other decisions under the same piece of legislation are not. It's important to really carefully identify whether there is a clear jurisdiction on the part of the AAT. If your concern relates to a decision of an administrative character made under an enactment, and that decision is not one where the AAT has jurisdiction, well, you can still seek legal review under the ADJR Act or under a constitutional writ, but you can't seek merits review. So that brings us to the end of our first video on merits review and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. We know that the AAT is an executive body, not a judicial body. It's a tribunal, not a court. As a result, it can review the merits of a decision without offending the separation of powers. We know that the jurisdiction of the AAT is defined within around 400 separate pieces of legislation where the AAT is given the power to review specific decisions. The second video this week takes us to the real heart of the material. We're going to look first at some of the challenges of conducting merits review, and then we're going to look at the remedies available to the AAT. See you in video two.